one thing, sir. I think it's one of the communications, Jerry. Uh, we're quite aware of the uh, feeling, I guess, is the proper terminology that prevails around the country, particularly in people thinking toward Vietnam. But uh, I think our major problem is one of uh, presenting West Point as it really is. Do you go after an athlete and then say, young man, how would you like to go to West Point? Or are you informed as to who's coming to West Point and then try to get the athletes to meet? Well, we hear about a lot of young prospects uh, through their success in high school, and we are naturally attracted to them. Uh, then the first thing we must do is check out their academic status and see if they can get in, and then encourage them toward the opportunity to prevail at West Point. Is it a difficult four years of a student's life in that studying hard and not having many hours for yourself would be considered difficult. Well, I think the effort that uh, is required during the four years as cadets at West Point is more than compensated for by the opportunity to prevail after West Point. And it's like everything else in life that we face, the good things come with a little effort. When press day arrives, you can count on it. The quarterback is surrounded by adulators, the split receivers and the defensive backs, the linebackers the running backs particularly, all the focal point of much, much attention. But what about the poor offensive center? For the Cowboys, that man is number 51, Dave Manders. Dave, I looked around, there must be at least 25 to 30 television stations and a couple of hundred reporters, and the offensive centers are being ignored again. It's not fair, is it? Not by Channel 8. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the point. Do you, get, do you ever get used to the anonymity of being down in the middle of that pile? No, you get kind of lazy, really. <laughs> uh, nobody has their eye on you particularly, and uh, it works out okay. I don't mind. You know, you've had a, a tremendous career with the Cowboys, and uh, can you recall the one, has there been any specific instance when you did generate a lot of publicity for the name of Dave Mandy? No, I don't believe so, Brian. Only, only on the rare occasions when the punter and the center goes over the punter's head, huh? <laughs> Take it back. <laughs> we had one score that was 31-2 to two against the Giants back in uh, 65. And the two points was caused by the center going over Don's head. So I guess the one time I did get a, quite a bit of publicity. Dave, obviously, though, uh, you are an integral part uh, of the Cowboy offensive line, which uh, Coach Landry now refers to as the best they've ever had in Dallas. And it's an, it's an amazing thing because of the, the uh, fluctuation you've had in the line. Don't you think? Yes, it is. Uh, we have only two people in their original positions, John Nyland and, uh, well, Ralph isn't even in his original position. He's that tackle, but it's the other tackle. And uh, I think what it, it just shows that we have some fine coaching. We're taught the basics and as rookies, our second and third years. And uh, once you learn the basics, you can fit anywhere into our offensive system in the offensive line. And uh, I think it's a great tribute, such as last week, for John Nyland pulled up lame with a Charlie horse in his leg. And uh, a play was called from the sideline, came in, and it meant that John had a pull and trap on that particular play. We just switched in the huddle. Blaine went to John's place, and John went over to Blaine's place and uh, ran the play from there and picked up about eight yards. So this is it's a real good feeling. It's a feeling of confidence uh, when you know you have this experience and versatility in the line. I would suppose, Dave, that uh, things will not change for Baltimore, that you would go with what has brung you, as Darrell Royal might say. Yes, and I don't think Baltimore is going to change for us, and uh, they're looking uh, extremely well defensively. Defensive front four is... Uh, very strong and aggressive. Personally, I have Mike Curtis to block the middle linebacker, and he has to rate <laughs> one of the top two or three in the league as far as the middle linebackers. It goes without saying, but best of luck to you. Thank you, Vern. Thank you. And thank you, Channel 8. Mandy will be there six days from today in the center of the line, wearing his number 51, blocking on Mike Curtis. Look for him. He might appreciate it. This is Vern Lundquist, Channel 8 Sports with the Cowboys in Fort Lauderdale, Florida.
There are a number of purposes for training camp. Obviously, the formulation of a 40-man roster to go through the 14-game schedule is the primary one. But training camp is also a time of intense personal battles for starting positions. One of the more interesting is taking place in the offensive line here at Thousand Oaks in 1973, pitting the champion and current holder of the position, Ralph Neely, the veteran, against Rodney Wallace, the young man who last year checked into camp 36 pounds overweight, but dedicated himself in the offseason to gaining Neely's spot. First, we hear from the man who holds the position, Ralph Neely. I think that uh, I'd already made up my mind after last year's uh, disappointing season to myself what I was going to do this off season, And, uh, you know, I started reading the papers and hearing the press and everything else about the other, but I was already into the working out before that all started. So it might have helped me push along and work a little bit harder, which competition will do. But I'd made up my mind what I was going to do uh, last January. You consider yourself an old man yet? No, I'm not old yet, but it, uh, I'm a lot older than I used to be. <laughs> have, you, have you slowed down any, do you think? Oh, sure. I've, you know, you've had three knee operations, and I got the ankle torn up, and uh, you have to slow down some, but uh, I think when you reach my age, you start using your head more and your body less, and I think that uh, maybe my experience will help make up for some of the lack of speed. As I said, last year, Rodney Wallace checked in 36 pounds overweight, but he was in Dallas during the offseason, worked strenuously, and time and time again, he told us, I'm going out to win that job. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, keep trying, you know. Ralph looks good. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I think I've got a little more experience than I had last year. He's, uh, he worked hard all offseason. I think I did, too. Uh, I had some problem with my knee what, last week, and it's starting to come around. So I'd say he's got a little bit of jump on me, not to mention the few years of experience. Do you consider yourself a more mature person this third year around? All depends on what you call maturity. In the sense of your approach uh, during the offseason, perhaps, toward uh, getting ready for football? Oh, yeah, keeping my weight down, understanding that I need to keep it down to uh, have more endurance, you know, uh, to keep from missing practices because of injury. The extra weight caused a little injury, not to mention problems, you know. It, uh, I think that's, uh, it's helped in that sense. Rodney, you said over and over during the offseason that you want that starting job. Uh, at this point in time, do you think you have a good shot at getting it? Yeah, I, uh, right now, as it is, is a matter of uh, refreshing the techniques and learning the whole system over again. Uh, I'm sure I I'll, I'll, will have my chance to start probably in the preseason sometime, and I think that's what it will be evaluated on. I'm sure this has a lot, a lot to do with it, but uh, the starting jobs and how, how you respond to that, I think, uh, holds a little weight also. One man who will have great bearing on the ultimate decision, the offensive line coach, Jim Myers. Would you anticipate that uh, this thing might go through the full six exhibition games before you make a decision? Oh, very definitely. Uh, uh, one has to, uh, of course, Rodney has to definitely beat Ralph out. There's no, there's no split decision on a, on a, a veteran player who's experienced and one that's making a challenge. We like this. It's healthy, and both of them are working hard. I wish we had it in other positions. Rodney indicates that uh, he thinks he's learned a lot in three years, that he's a much more mature man now than he was, when, obviously, when he first came in. But uh, in contrast to that, Ralph says, I've got all that experience going for me. Well, it's quite obvious that uh, Rodney, uh, you know, coming in last year at 286 <laughs> pounds, wasn't very mature at that time. <laughs> so I would have to say that's a very correct statement. And uh, 
I think maybe Ralph matured a little bit and then uh, analyzed himself and looked at himself and uh, said, Ralph, it's time for you to make a change and uh, let's go on with the show. I think that's Ralph's attitude and uh, I think it's wonderful, really. As I said at the outset, there are a number of personal battles that always take place in training camp. This one this year just happens to be one of the most interesting and the ultimate decision probably won't be reached until the conclusion of the exhibition season. From Thousand Oaks, California, this is Vern Lundquist, Channel 8 Sports. Wait till you see him, they said when we got to camp. Well, that's him, Otto Stowe, who's been the rage of camp so far. He, of course, is the wide receiver acquired from Miami Dolphins in that much publicized trade. The Cowboys gave up a lot to get him. They gave up Ron Sellers, last year's leading pass uh, receiver, as well as a number two draft choice. But according to everything we have heard here in California, the price was well worth it. Otto, I know you had a chance during the spring to work out with the club in Dallas, so it wasn't a totally new experience for you coming out to camp. No, it wasn't. I've uh, had the opportunity of going to Dallas and working out with uh, some of the fellows and uh, trying to get the system uh, learned and everything. And so it hasn't been a totally new adjustment for me. Is the system appreciably different than what you were used to in Miami? Well, it's somewhat different in that we uh, have a lot of different formations and uh, the calls are different, but uh, basically uh, professional football is professional football. You know, every every wide receiver wants to catch the ball. That's his primary function in being there. You're going from a non-passing team primarily to another non-passing team. Uh, have you have you sensed any reorientation toward the passing game here? Uh, I don't know. We've been working on a lot of things. Uh, I don't know what the statistics were on passing last year. Hopefully, I can I can uh, add to uh, the passing game this year and and maybe uh, open it up a little bit more. That's what I'm looking forward to. What would be a good year for you statistically? Uh, a good year for me would be. Uh, Dallas going to the Super Bowl and winning it. You'd like that back-to-back -back Super Bowl oh, appearance, definitely, huh? Definitely. 25,000 doesn't hurt. That's right. Three for three. Otto, playing behind Warfield, did you pick up any of his specific styles or moves? Did, uh, did he teach you at all? Charlie Waters, after working against Otto Stowe for three weeks, had an interesting observation. Charlie said, in my mind, there are three great receivers in the league. Paul Warfield of Miami, obviously, in a class by himself. Next, I'd classify Gene Washington of San Francisco and Charlie Taylor of the Redskins as the two best. After three weeks of working against Otto Stowe, I'd put Otto Stowe in that category. The words from defensive back Charlie Waters. This is Vern Lundquist, Channel 8 Sports with the Cowboys in Thousand Oaks, California.
know, I try and put myself in other people's shoes. And as an athlete, you, you know, you really can't do that. But in, you know, Craig and I have uh, played together, and I, I've I've talked things over, you know, over with him and to a degree. And you know, it's a tremendous disappointment from disappointment for him. And uh, you know, in a way, I'm kind of subdued about it. But yet, you know, when I think of the excitement of, of playing and performing and, and getting the chance to to determine the fate of our, our team this season. You know, it's exciting. That's what life's all about, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. The preseason really didn't determine a, a great deal, and, of course, everyone remembers my last performance, which was uh, unsatisfactory against Miami, and uh, so it's, uh, you know, a divided situation as far as I think people are concerned, and uh, as far as Craig and I are concerned, uh, we both won to start, and, uh, you know, I feel fortunate I've got that opportunity. Roger, obviously, you're you're aware of the fact that the community is split on this thing. Uh, is the team? Do you think they'd have gone e behind either one of you, no matter who Tom named? Yes, definitely, I, I do. Uh, the uh, th there's no question about that. I think the team would have, you know, definitely got behind either one of us, and uh, there wasn't any uh, factor on our team that uh, would have pulled uh, against either one of us. Garrison's talents on the football field. You've seen him run up and down the Cotton Bowl in Texas Stadium many, many times. You're also aware, I'm sure, of the fact that uh, during the offseason, he's a rodeo performer. Let me introduce another of Walt Garrison's talents. He is a whittler. And if you can figure out how he got those rings on there, you're better than I. We talked with Walt during an afternoon break to have him explain how he does something like this. Now, you want to explain to me exactly what you're doing? Uh, this is going to be uh, one of these when it gets uh, when you get it finished. It's just an arrow that's got a washer on it, which is uh, basically simple, right? Yeah, Walt. How'd you get the washer on there? <laughs> well, you take one of these washers and you put it in the ground, and then you put 
This is basswood here, so you get a basswood nut, and you break it open, you get the seed, you put it right in the middle of the washer, fertilize it, and when it grows up, well, the washer comes up, and you whittle just, the tree off. Just that no, simple. No, I'm not going to tell you. That's right. it, it only takes 24 years to get one of those things ready. Well, you got one here that I, I've got to pick up. Now, this that's the darndest thing I've ever seen. You've got three washers on there. You're not going to well, tell us how you did it? No, not really. In fact, this is the only one uh, that I've seen like this. Uh, uh, my daddy showed me how, uh, you know, showed me this one to start with, and then so I came up with one with three, and I'm fixing to do one with about eight on it, I think. Had to take you a long time to grow that tree through those three washers. Well, you know, if you, when you grow three like that, you just stack them up, and then as a tree, of course, you know, gets larger. I mean, it just separates them by itself as it grows up. How can you sit there without <laughs> laughing at me and tell me that? Do you soak the wood? No. <laughs> You're not going to tell me what you do. No. I asked I've you. had everything. Uh, they say you heat the washer and turn it inside out, and it makes the hole bigger. <laughs> Which, I mean, I guess that's right, but uh, I don't know what you hold the washer with when you get it hot. Let me let me pick up one more you've got right. here. Now, how do you how do you go about something like this? You've got the washer again. That had to be oh, a yeah, complicated that's, that's tree. just a little deal there, but this is just a little chain, which is basically simple, and in a, in a ball inside of a box. It, and people say, well, how would you get the ball in there? Well, I didn't really. It was already in there. You just cut out the wood from Carp around, around it. it. Yeah. The ball's already in there. It won't come out, I hope. How long did it take you to do that? Uh, it doesn't take real long. You can, uh, I can do one of these in... Uh, you know, if I didn't have to practice, I could do one a lot quicker, but uh, <laughs> I can do one of these in a, you know, a day or... The doggone two a days really interfere with your whittling, don't it they? It really does. Uh, this is one, when I was hurt, I hurt my back, and so I, I laid off a couple of days and really got some whittling done. So I whittled this in, in about a day and a half, I mean, just on and off. Now, that really is pretty. Uh, what, is a, what kind of wood did you use? This is basswood here. I it, do most of my whittling out of basswood or... Uh, uh, all spruce or sugar pine, white pine, and uh, I'm just starting on some cypress knees that uh, a guy gave me the other day, and so I'm going to try to whittle over and see what, what kind of wood that is. Is there any tremendous significance in the fact that your best piece is a dolphin? <laughs> no, uh, I didn't really have that in mind when I started on it. I uh, saw a picture of it in the book in there, so I uh, you know, I thought it might be pretty good. And it's pretty easy to whittle, mainly. Obviously, uh, Walter, you're good at this. We talked with Mike Montgomery yesterday, and uh, I noticed that his index finger and his thumb were cut. He's one of my uh, pupils, and uh, if his fingers hold up, you know, he's going to learn to whittle. But uh, he's, he's a little reckless right now, and, and uh, therefore he cuts his fingers. I don't know. I, I, I cut mine quite a bit when I first started. I don't, uh, I don't cut them uh, as deep now as I used to, but uh, you still nick them every once in a while because knives are pretty sharp. So, uh, you know, you have to be careful. Do you sell these? No. Uh, you know, uh, my daddy asked me, why don't you sell that? And I said, well, you know, you could make a quarter an hour, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you sold them for a ton, you know. No, I just will just, uh, it relaxes me and uh, gives me something to do, and it makes the time pass, you know. I suppose if you want, you can choose to accept Mr. Garrison's explanation that he grew a tree through the ringers. <laughs> Obviously, there must be something more to it than that, just as there are many facets to the man we know as Walt Garrison. Vern Lundquist, Channel 8 Sports with the Cowboys in Thousand Oaks, California.
Let's get him over here. How about, how about a pillow, huh? <laughs> hey, watch him. Who on one of them? Hey, I got a free one. You got a free? Yeah, I got a free one. You like that one, sir? Who on one? Here you go. Hey, we coming over here. Dollar quarter. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Hey, 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 you way down there. Is it? Yeah, they're calling you down there. <laughs> Who want a free one? Who want a free one? Who's gonna win today? Huh? The Cowboys gonna win. Watch it, Dells. Look at here. Watch it. Oh, watch him, huh? Watch him. Hey, who want a free one? Who want a free one here? Hey, I got one. How about a good one over here? You want one? You enjoying the game? Don't understand, huh? No. no. Uh, this is a pimple I'll give you, okay? Free from looking. Okay. Watch this in. Oh. Thank you. Hey, who want a free one over here? Who want a free one? Who want a free one? Here you are. Here you go. Here you free one over here. Here you go. I want to get a dollar and quarter tax. <laughs> hey, look, who's gonna win this game? Dallas? By a long shot. By a long shot. Big long shot. Hey, I got some more. Who want a free one? Hey, who want a free one? This was the Cowboy practice field at Thousand Oaks yesterday afternoon. There's some strange numbers being worn by the running backs out there for a variety of reasons. Calvin Hill is in number 37. Roger Staubach is resurrected number 17 for the purposes of this practice. The guy who's in shorts is Walt Garrison. None of that's surprising because it's a rather ordinary session on a Tuesday afternoon. But there's one number who is missing. Number 33, Dwayne Thomas, did not show up for practice. Coach, it's now after midnight, West Coast time. Uh, Dwayne missed practice in the afternoon, the evening meeting. At what point was a decision made to trade him to San Diego? Well, actually, the decision was made this evening. As you know, we're on a deadline right tonight at midnight with the American Football Conference. Uh, and we had uh, an opportunity to trade him, which I felt was good for our club. We needed some help uh, at the running back spot. And uh, so we went ahead and made the trade that involved Thomas. Was the interleague deadline the important factor or his missing practice and team meetings? Well, I think the fact of missing the day was a, a big factor uh, in our decision to go ahead. Uh, and the fact that we did have the deadline of the American Football Conference this made it seem right to do it now because I felt it was time now maybe to give uh, Dwayne another chance to work with maybe another club. He's had a lot of problems with our club. Uh, a lot of through the last couple of years and possibly this will be a better move for him I don't really know coach you've said uh, time and time again you've exhibited time and time again that you were a man of patience was your patience just at the breaking point by the latest uh, episode well I don't know that my patience ever at the breaking point uh, I do things basically by feel uh, what I think is best for this team and uh, I think that we have shown a great deal of patience in, in handling uh, in this particular situation of trying to point out the things that were necessary, you know, for Dwayne to go on with us. And uh, when this doesn't, when he doesn't follow uh, this, then, it, then we reach a point where we think it's best for the team not to, to go ahead with him. It was a long, kind of sad, but obviously momentous day for the Dallas Cowboys. 
beginning, as you saw, with Dwayne Thomas's absence from practice in the afternoon, going from there to a meeting with Tom Landry that apparently bore no fruit, and culminating in his trade just before midnight to the San Diego Chargers. There's a sense of deja vu about all of this, as though we've all been through it before. The reason for that, of course, was the Thomas trade last year, the abortive Thomas trade to the New England Patriots. So an era in the Cowboy history is gone. Dwayne Thomas now with the San Diego Chargers. In a way, it's kind of sad. This is Vern Lundquist with the Dallas Cowboys for Channel 8 Sports in Thousand Oaks, California. probably in a little bit later and look at him. I've never seen him really out on the field before, so until I see him there and talk to him, I really don't know. Uh, but it, it will probably be speculated on after the rookie camp. And I would suppose then once you get into training camp at Thousand Oaks, you'll try and make a decision as to what his uh, future might be before you get into exhibition season. Well, we have to do that. And the unfortunate thing is that he'll be in an all-star game, you know, and therefore he'll miss most of our important work. and. Uh, Therefore, we'll be probably most of the summer if we don't make the decision. If we make the decision, you know, now to try him as a linebacker in, in camp, then we're going to spend a lot of time making that try. And if we say, you know, this spring that we don't think he can play there, then he'll be much ready, more ready to play this year than he would be otherwise. Yes, Thomas E. Henderson, yes. My mother likes me to be called Thomas. She uh, named me that when I was born, so <laughs> she wants everybody to call me that. Were you surprised uh, at Dallas making that choice? Well, yes, I was surprised. I didn't think I would go in the first round, but Dallas had sent me a lot of literature, and they had uh, scouted me pretty well. And uh, uh, Gil Brandt put out a uh, publication in Oklahoma City that uh, I would be the first player in Oklahoma drafted, you know, out of Rod Schott, Randy Hughes, and these fellows. Did you believe that at the time? <laughs> no, I thought it was just mere <laughs> media. How long do you think it'll take you to fit into the Cowboys system? Well, uh, I have a lot to learn. Uh, coming from a si situation that I came from, Lancaster University, which was a small black university, I imagine there's a lot of things I have to learn and a lot of adjustments I have to make and a lot of sacrifices I have to make. But uh, I, would, I don't want to uh, say how long it'll take me. Uh, I hope, I'm hoping the first game. I tell you, it's a wonderful feeling. Uh, when I first heard the rumor at the beginning of the year, I tried not to pay any attention to it, but I find myself thinking, what, it, what would it be like to be the number one pick? And here I am, and it's unbelievable. Is it true that basketball referees drove you into football? That's true. I lost all interest my senior year in high school when uh, the officials wouldn't allow me to play my game. Uh, the majority <laughs> of the school we played, I was the largest uh, guy on the court, and they allowed the small man to push me around, and I would end up with four fouls the first half, and I couldn't stand sitting on the bench. <laughs> but I prefer the NFL. And the Cowboys are my team. They've been my team for five years, so I, would, I think I would enjoy playing in the NFL, especially with the Cowboys. All right. Watch the get Minnesota game, and they all look good, but I think I can start. I don't know where, but I think I can start here, Cowboys. Gil, how long ago did you definitely make the decision to make him your number one choice? Well, we felt all along that he was the top player in the country, but uh, it's hard to make the final decision until about a week before the draft. And I would say about a week before the draft, he made the decision. Exactly how tall are you and exactly what do you weigh? 
Right now, I weigh 260, but every time the scouts measure me, they get a different size, so I don't know how tall I am. <laughs> It all depends upon what time of the day you measure. In the morning, you're six nine, and then in, the, in the evening, you shrink a little bit to about six eight. About 270 turned out for the Cowboys tryouts this morning. Many were guys who play college football but didn't make the pro draft, or never finished college, or had been cut by other teams. But also among the hopefuls were bronc riders and soccer players. The prospect is alluring. Not only are they attracted by the chance to play in the big league, but also by the $14,000 a year minimum salary. The Cowboys last year picked only a handful of men, and none ever made the lineup. But one who did make the Cowboys tryouts was traded to Kansas and played on their starting lineup all year. This year, the Cowboys are looking for size and speed, but that's not all. Potential players could still be dropped if they flunk kicking and passing auditions. Of the hundreds to try out for the Dallas Cowboys, only a few can be chosen. They will receive memberships in one of the NFL's most prestigious clubs and go on to grueling workouts with the hopes of making the lineup. Those who don't make it today will go back where they came from, some only to bide their time until next year when they can try again. Maury Dial, Channel 8 News at Texas Stadium. Cowboy fans got a glimpse of future greatness Saturday night. Ed Jones, top draft choice in the country, ravaged Raider quarterbacks, even in a 20-point Dallas defeat. Well, I think I had a pretty decent game. I played pretty well in the spots. I made a lot of mistakes, and after watching the film last night, and I had working on this weekend. Hopefully, I do better this weekend against L.A. This is a tough defense to learn, is it not? Yes, it is. You're this is a defense, uh, you really have to discipline yourself because you're uh, flexing a lot, you have a lot of stunts in the line, and it's really rough, I tell you. Were you double teamed quite a bit Saturday night in Oakland? Yes, I was. That was a surprise. A me. little bit of a surprise for you? It was, it really was. I, I guess that, that probably will be a standard though throughout the year, don't you think? Well, I hope so. If they double team me throughout the year, I know then I'm doing my job. You know, Ernie, uh, Ernie said something about uh, once you remember to use the hand slap again, things are going to get really rough. Well, right now I have two jam fingers on both hands. That's why I haven't been using it as much, and I hope they're better by this weekend. Have you been tested at all? Did you get a, did you get a good test Saturday night? Yes, I did. I was going against one of our veterans the first half, and uh, he's really tough. Held you a little bit too, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. Uh, they tell me all the veterans are doing that, though. Cowboy line coach Ernie Staubner says Jones is still raw, still confused, still learning. Indeed, still growing. Right now, he's 6'8", 266. And Staubner says Jones has an excellent chance of starting for the Cowboys in his first year. Vern Lundquist, Channel 8 Sports, Thousand Oaks, California.
had grown late, very late for Miami. And now Doomsday would end the dream for good with another veteran of past failure, Chuck Howley, accepting the honor. In every season since 1966, Tom Landry had watched his team lose the one game that really mattered. Now he looked on as his Dallas Cowboys finally sealed sweet victory. Dallas led 24-3. And for the first time in their history, the crown fit. The hour had grown late, and the joyous trumpet blasts of Miami's arrival were now silent. The bright orange balloon of Miami's season had descended. The high crest of emotion now shrunken hard in the cold afternoon sun. But a memory remained, the image of a remarkable season put together by an unlikely team. The Dolphins were determined to have one last moment. Miami's last drive ended as had its first, and the domination was complete. In the gloom of the moment, the Dolphins could not be consoled. But a real triumph remained. They had come so far, so fast, and they would get another chance. Dallas had needed six. Every time he goes up in there, he loses the ball. Stay on your feet. 
your feet. Dog, got it. That's okay. A fumble doesn't hurt us. We got the game. Hey, Walt. Wow, man, what happened? Hey, my tongue. Your tongue? I guess you realize now this is a pretty rough game. Or either that or you just keep your tongue in your mouth. All right. Ooh, man. Oh, finally. Finally. Oh. What do you think, Coach? The Dallas Cowboys accepted their championship, not with a wild scream of triumph, but with an easy sigh of relief. Twelve years separated Tom Landry from his first dream to its realization, and in the end, the long, hard road made the final destination seem all the sweeter.